Welcome to our Global Goodness webinar. Our topic today is the interreligious dialogue on global ethics. The year 2021 is bit by bit drawing to an end. It has not been the greatest year in terms of international exchange. Different countries and different groups within those countries seem to be in stark opposition to one another. At the same time, our wicked global problems need urgent solutions. On the other hand, in the past decades, representatives of religions have conducted a fruitful dialogue on global ethics. What a wonderful idea. Talk about the evolving ethics in peace and harmony. Each faith has unique qualities, but today we'll talk about the possibilities of cooperation. My name is Maya Taulila, and I have the great privilege of introducing our prestigious guests. I'll mention just a few of their numerous merits. Tapio Luoma is the Archbishop of Finland's Evangelical Lutheran Church. Before his election to the office in 2018, Luoma worked as a pastor in several parishes in southern Ostrobotnia for 25 years and as bishop of the Diocese of Espo from 2012 to 2018. In 2000, he was awarded the title of Pastor of the Year. Tapio Luoma, you are definitely our bishop of the day. Uh, you are warmly welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jevanna uh, Mukta, also called Juan Francisco La Fontaine, is doctor of philosophy in the study of religions at the University of Helsinki. He is a teacher, trainer, and mentor in Kundalini Yoga in the Kundalini Research Institute. He is also director of the meditative healing program at Yoga La Fontaine. You are very warmly welcome. Thank you, Maya Rita. Thank you for the invitation. Great to have you. Muki Al Sharmani is an associate professor of Islamic and Middle Eastern studies at the University of Helsinki. She holds a doctorate in cultural anthropology from Johns Hopkins University, USA. Currently, she works on, for example, contemporary Muslim women's engagement with the Quran and Islamic interpretive tradition in Finland and Egypt, Quran Quranic ethics and Islamic feminist feminist exegesis. Welcome, Monkey. Great to Thank have you. you with us. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Well, let's uh, let's start with a few questions. They are difficult, but as I have a congregation of wise persons, I want to know a few things. Uh, Tapio Luoma, as the Archbishop, you are often required to take a stand on very complicated moral problems. It's also often stated that the Lutheran Christianity has no social ethics of its own. Do you maybe share this view? Or in other words, uh, where does the Lutheran Church find its ethical guidelines? Well, thank you for the question. First of all, I would like to underline the, the feature that you mentioned in your question, so that today we are facing very complicated moral problems. So it seems that the development of world and world politics and also the role of religions is something that we find ourselves in a very, very complex situation uh, where it is difficult to find easy solutions to difficult questions. And I think that uh, uh, this is an important uh, field where also the cooperation of different religions is, is highly needed. And I appreciate uh, the theme of this webinar when where we really constructively try to find out uh, what are the possibilities of religions doing together. Uh, now, what comes to the Lutheran Christianity, we know that uh, Lutheran Christianity is only one uh, globally minor strand in, in the large field of Christian churches. But anyway, uh, its impact has been quite influential, especially in Western countries. Uh, 
first of all, if I think that what is uh, the most characteristic uh, basic feature of, of, uh, of ethical thinking in Lutheran Christianity, I think that it is the, uh, uh, there are two things. One, one of them is, of course, the central uh, solution or central place of the Holy Bible, the Holy Book of the Christian religion. And, and secondly, uh, in, especially in Lutheran Christianity, uh, emphasis is laid very heavily upon rationality. So that uh, in, in, in Lutheranism, we think that uh, rationality is one of the good gifts of God. So it means that uh, these two, two, two uh, dimensions combine, combined together, the Holy Bible and rationality, uh, give us a very good uh, uh, guideline to what is good and, uh, and uh, to what, uh, what is the good end in our lives. Uh, from these premises, it is true that the Lutheran ethics puts emphasis on common moral sense as God's gift to all humanity. And there is no such special Christian ethics that would make Christians morally superior to other people. And I think this is one of the uh, uh, most important things to remember. We all must use our God-given capacities for compassion and rational thinking. At the same time, uh, referring now to the message of the, of the Holy Bible, uh, there we see how Jesus uh, uh, conducted his life and how he taught. Uh, Jesus instructed us to base our moral judgment on the golden rule. Whatever you want people do to you, do the same to them. And of course, also the imperative of love is a very central phenomenon in, in a feature in, in, uh, in Jesus' uh, proclamation. And also his example also tells that we should pay special attention to those who are in uh, the most vulnerable position that are not able to defend themselves, uh, who are forgotten and uh, who are in the margins of the society. That does, I think, constitute a particular ethics of what we Christians call God's kingdom. I mean, a, a kind of a, a kingdom without, uh, without um, visible boundaries, uh, where the, the central themes are compassion, everyone's inalienable worth, and the cause of the deprived. Uh, I think that these are the elements uh, upon which the uh, Lutheran uh, ethics uh, is, is very much uh, um, uh, based on. Uh, Martin Luther was, was the great figure of Lutheran Christianity. Uh, he lived in the, in the 16th century. And one of his great ideas was that because God has loved us, we are obliged to love each other. And our love should be also a, a kind of godlike love towards each other, so that we should uh, try to love those who are not in the position of being loved uh, uh, when judged uh, in a very human way. So that we should always find the target of our love in those who are uh, in some, in, in some uh, way deprived or who are in a vulnerable position. And this, I think, is one of the uh, basic features of Lutheran ethics, uh, which, as I said, is not very much, uh, or, or it, it try, tries to be uh, a very human and universal ethics as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the rationality um, aspect is very interesting these days, especially because uh, behavioral economists have found out that it was pretty much an illusion. <laughs> and, and in philosophical ethics, our view of human beings is critical. Are we really the autonomous and, and rational masters of the universe that we sometimes imagine? Or are we a part and parcel and entirely dependent on the nature as a whole? Uh, this is crucial when we talk about biodiversity, for example, and, and so I would like to know how you outline a view of us humans. Yes, uh, I think that the, what, what comes to the uh, understanding of what a human being is, 
uh, then we need to also, uh, again go to the very beginnings of, of, of the Holy Bible where, where the, the, it is told how God created everything that is there and, and uh, also how he created a, a human being. And it is said that uh, we human beings, we are created in the image of God. And um, theologians have very much thought about what might this mean. First of all, I think it means that every human being has a worth, a kind of divine worth, so, so, so to say. And also every um, person also has uh, responsibility. When God created uh, the first human beings, he put them into paradise in order to take care of the garden and in order to, to, to also to, to get nourishment, nourishment from it. But anyway, uh, unfortunately, uh, we know that uh, we human beings have forgotten, uh, especially in, in, uh, in recent uh, decades and, and centuries, our responsibility as guardians and, and, take, uh, and care caretakers. But we have tried to uh, nourish ourselves perhaps too much uh, on the expense of, of this nature. Uh, I think we humans, like all creation, uh, we are funda fundamentally vulnerable. So we feel pain. We make um, now and then costly mistakes. We hurt ourselves and each other. We grow old and weak and then we die. So we are kind of, um, we have limits. Our existence has limits. And it, it is also one of the uh, basic features of how to be a wise person, to accept limits. And uh, <clears throat> it is uh, this awareness of, uh, of this fundamental vulner vulnerability and limit limitless uh, and, and limitedness that should feed compassion in us and make us aware of the pre preciousness of not only human life, but indeed all life. We know that um, there is a threat to all life uh, on, on this planet at the moment. And, and there are very, very gr grave uh, moral issues ahead of us, how to resolve them and how to be, uh, how, how the solutions could be uh, justified, how they can be equal to all people all over the world and how we could uh, increase our awareness and our respect for the created world. I think that um, uh, for example, biodiversity, for example, is one of the crucial problems we are facing at the moment. And, and of course, uh, are we human, as human beings, we have a great responsibility in facing and addressing these challenges. A very illuminating view of us humans. You mentioned equality of all people all over the world, and that is part of the idea of global ethics but it has also created a lot of dissonance in the discussion. Uh, what do you think about the project of global ethics? Is it theoretically desirable or if, if it is, uh, does it have practical potential? I think, I think that uh, in my opinion, it, it should be very much global uh, ethics. And, and so, uh, as I told, uh, Lutheran ethics is something something that uh, will align itself with 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 all rational of ways of of deciding what is good and, and what is wrong, and I think that um, one of the great uh, projects for us is to find out what could be a global ethics be like, and and in this uh, endeavor, I think that we religions we need each other, we need need to recognize. Uh, uh, in, in, in each of us religions, we need to recognize uh, the, the thrive to find harmony. And I think that every religion uh, has its own solution how to find harmony. Harmony with other people, harmony with nature, harmony with divinity. And I guess that uh, uh, a durable uh, global ethics is something that needs also these religious uh, viewpoints to take in to take to taken seriously uh, i think that the global ethics uh, is very much uh, desirable as i do believe in inherent universal worth of human life and of all god's creation my christian view of ethical responsibility is necessarily 
global and universal. Everyone has equal worth and everyone's equal worth must be respected. Everyone is my neighbor. Every creature is my fellow sentient being. And as we all share this common planet and as the planet indeed grows but smaller all the time, I do think global ethics is also a practical necessity. Different rules to different people will not do. Moral responsibility cannot be selective. And vulnerable creatures, as we are, without common responsibility and without mutual care, we are lost. Thank you. That is music to my ears, especially because harmony is a term related to music. We can really sing together. Thank you. Uh, let us hear some ideas uh, from Yevan Mukta. You are a researcher, yogi, yoga teacher, and also well-versed in yogic studies, new religious movements, history of religion, and the philosophy of religious experience, among other things. How do you see the role of ethics in yoga, or if you like, in Hinduism? Is it more like a way or a destination? All right. Well, thank you, Mayarita and uh, Archbishop and uh, Mulki. I'm uh, grateful to also meet you and have this, this discussion. Um, this, is, this is a really significant question. I think that there are many ways to answer, but in essence, when we study and engage with the practices and the philosophy that Hindus, yogis, and Indian uh, world of spirituality have delivered, we find one very central theme, which is the um, encountering of the self, the realization of the self. And uh, this is for understanding the true nature of our, our beings, our, our humanity in this process. Um, we learn also to uh, get over the individualism and the selfishness that the self might, on the way to discover it, uh, bring on our way somehow. There's, then there are tendencies in, in our life that are unknown, that are subconscious, that are uh, hidden in our mind and in our hearts. And so the process of yoga and the ethics of yoga is to really get to, technically speaking, go deep into one's own life, mind and soul, to discover what is the actual essence of who we are. And in that process, awaken to that natural tendency to become better humans. I think in some ways, yoga is uh, an expression of the natural tendency in as much as we all, go to bed every night thinking of what we didn't do well and thinking of how can we improve our lives? How can we become better people? At least I think this is a very common feature we all share. And uh, the, the protocol, ethical protocols, as well as philosophical aims of this philosophy and religion, if we can call it religion, um, basically, basically aim at supporting the individual process to overcome the individualism and be one with everything. And that everything implies our neighbors, our nature, our world, of course, the universe and God. So in that process, we learn to purify those things that are somehow irrelevant for us to live life meaningfully and, and embrace rather those things that are deeply embedded in our true nature as human beings. So the, 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 the ethics is revolving around this process and is supporting the process and is not exclusive as some people might think to one individual person. It is actually a person that is part of an ecosystem of spiritual forces or reality of, of uh, nature and even more than that, an entire um, connection that every human being has with the entire creation itself. Thank you. Your view reminds me of the fact that you've often talked about perennial philosophy. What do you mean by that? Well, in some ways, 
when we uh, explore these philosophies and this understanding of, of yogis and, and Hindu saints and sadhus and gurus, um, we, we realize that there is a very strong pursuit of knowing the base of reality by learning to discriminate what we are from what we are not. So in that process, we build up bridges to sources of wisdom that we can say are common to everyone. Um, this idea of perennial philosophy is a Western idea that basically was made famous by Aldous Huxley, who wrote the book with that name, that in his book, he addressed different religions and spiritual systems and uh, became aware that there's a lot of common places and overlapping ideas that different religions have. Now, from the point of view of yoga, the deep introspection that is possible through meditation and prayer that is part of the yogic system, we arrive to an experience, or a personal experience that, that has a lot of commonalities. And that is what historians of religions have um, labeled as religious experience. So religious experience has elements, not in how we interpret them, but how we actually we go through them, that have a lot of commonalities. That is actually rooted in what I, I, I consider to be the perennial philosophy. It's the understanding, as the Archbishop just said, like how important is compassion? How important is to live in harmony? And that is actually common ground for all religions. Compassion, harmony, the caring about each other, the service to the congregation. And how we arrive to this is, of course, our personal path and process through our studies, through our sacred texts, but also through our own experience. And we can arrive to that collective, so, so to speak, uh, substance of our collective unconsciousness, which brings about a lot of these principles that, as the history develops, develops into religious expressions. I think that there is a uh, religious seed in the, heart, in the heart of every human being. And that religious seed is rooted in the same grounds. And those grounds are the ones I consider to be the perennial philosophy as I have explained. Very good. Now we are already observing some shared values that might be universalizable. But we're not just talking about the values as such. We're also talking about cooperation, which we need to solve the wicked problems of our time, like climate change, biodiversity loss, poverty, etc. So just to make it more concrete, uh, what is your approach? How should we tackle these challenges? Cooperation. Um, well, I think that you mentioned at the beginning that this particular discussion we're having now of a, a, the is interreligious um, frame um, is, is something actually very important. And, and just one correction to it. The first time this was done was in the year 1893. There's the first uh, World Parliament of Religions that was conducted by world leaders that were meeting in Chicago in the year 1893. And amongst them, uh, Vivekananda, that is the first yogi actually that came to the Western civilization, expressed the principles that, that actually help us to cooperate. And one of them is actually to abandon fanaticism. And this is perhaps the, the most uh, controversial cancer, we can say, that all religious uh, institutions and, and groups share. And so we need to identify what are, the, what are the problems because at the end of the day, people have the tendency, as I'm mentioning, to become better. We all want to be better. Religious also want to be better. What are the things that are on the way for this development? And I think that is fanaticism. So we need to observe the obstacles to the cooperation rather than just talk about cooperation. What is on the way for us to just sit and listen to each other 
understand that at the end of the day, we share much more than what we think. And our religious premises and, and, and beliefs will help us to see this when we actually sit and discuss these things. I think this space is a concrete way to do it. If this is not enough, of course, we can say so in terms of what really makes, makes the difference is that we reach and inspire those who are in decision-making uh, decision making offices, decision-making um, organizations. And I think that one of the first things to do, in my humble opinion, is that we will really look for people that are starving in this planet. Famine is actually a reality. And if a part of the population is dying because of hunger, what we, what we have to understand is that there's, along with them, another big, big part of the population that is just not feeding themselves. Think of those children that are not growing their brains. How can we cooperate? Well, we all want to cooperate. But then let's look at those who need most of our attention. Those are the obstacles our society has. Hunger is one of the biggest ones. We need the brains of those children in Africa and Asia, in South America and other places. We need those brains to develop. We need those brains to actually mature because that is going to make them be more aware of the importance of precisely the ecosystem. When people are in hunger, they don't develop that awareness. They don't develop the awareness that there is a fellow man and fellow woman next to them. They're just in survival mode. I think these are the concrete things that we need to speak about and inspire people in politics and decision-making positions. It's great that you remind us of the fact that we actually need some preconditions for cooperation. And those are related to attending to the needs of those who are most in the need. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Mulki Al-Sharmani, you are a pioneer in developing new perspectives on Islam studies. Can you please talk about, for example, Islamic feminist exegesis? Yes. Um... First of all, I'm, uh, I want to thank the audience for their interest, and I also want to thank my co-panelists uh, for their insights. Uh, I found a lot of uh, interesting things and commonalities hopefully will come up in the conversation. Uh, now, uh, Maya, Rita, thank you for organizing this. Uh, now, um, I, I want to say a good question. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a pioneer in it. Uh, I study it, and uh, there are, I study the scholars, uh, scholars slash activists who are in engaging in this and uh, this is part of a, a scholarship known as Islamic feminism, although sometimes the term also is contested. And it started in the late 80s, uh, early 90s uh, of the last century. And um, on the one hand, uh, although there are pioneer works before that, uh, and it's undertaken predominantly by Muslim women scholars, uh, interestingly, from different parts of the world, from the global north as well as the global south, you know, um, and they um, engage with uh, the Quran, you know, the, which is in Islamic theology considered uh, a divine, the, the word of uh, God, uh, as well as Islamic legal tradition, as well as the prophetic tradition. So the main Islamic texts uh, and doing two things, uh, you know, one trying to trace uh, where dominant patriarchal interpretations, how did they come about? you know, that discriminate against women, what were the methodologies and what were the worldviews that made these interpretations dominant and then became a basis for rulings, for laws and so on and norms. And number two, provide alternative interpretations, alternative uh, readings um, that uh, um, affirm uh, gender equality, inclusiveness. Uh, and these women scholars slash activists uh, are, um, you know, they undertake these uh, scientific inquiry, which they also consider an ethical inquiry uh, from a faith base. So they do not shy away from saying that they are believing Muslims. They think actually uh, they are working from within the tradition. Now, why is this scholarship relevant to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, our seminar here, our talk, which is about global ethics and so on? I think it's very relevant because it, with the work that they're doing, they want to also inform uh, politics 
policy making. They want to ref you know, uh, create a space for new kinds of religious discourses and religious sensibilities. But it's also specifically relevant to what we're discussing today, because these uh, scholars slash activists are really engaged with the question of the relationship between the ethical and the normative uh, in Islamic main texts. Like, you know, so for example, in the Quran, uh, and what is the ethical worldview of the Quran? What does it mean that uh, for in the in Islamic theology, the idea of God, uh, the unity of God, Wahdaniyat Allah, the Tawheed, does that simply mean uh, live, uh, believing in one God and that's it, and not having uh, associ uh, associating other partners with God? That's one very surface meaning of it. But these scholars go deeper through their hermeneutical studies and see, okay, well, uh, in acting uh, Tawheed, which is a very core in Islamic theology, actually uh, on, uh, as a social praxis, can only mean not ha having uh, egalitarian relationships, relationships that are based on inclusivity, harmony, uh, uh, and uh, that, that have no space for discrimination and inequality. So, you know, they are linking the the theological, the ethical, and the normative. They look at, for example, the scripture in the Quran uh, and how it is very much uh, emphasizes key ethical concepts. For example, taqwa, which means it's translated sometimes as God's fearing, but actually it's living a life of in God's presence. So what does that mean to live a life in which you are... Um, uh, your life, in, you are in the presence of God. Your life is a demonstration of being present, be living with the divine. Uh, you know, the Quran has these other concepts like ihsan, which means goodness and beauty. Ma'roof, what is commonly known, good. So many, very different, different kinds of ethical concepts that are not random, that are repeated, that they have relations among themselves. So they try to trace this Quranic ethical worldview and see, okay, what does it mean in terms of ethics, ethical principles that we should be living by, and what are the implications of these ethical principles, not only for the gender question, but beyond. So in, in that sense, I think it's what they're doing is quite relevant to what we're discussing uh, today. And sometimes it, this has been termed in, in Islamic studies as the ethical turn, so the interest and the focus on what is ethical and how does can that inform the normative? And it's it's being undertaken by other scholars as well. But I think the Islamic feminist actions particularly have certain important contribution in in that sense. Thank you. That was a great exposition on global ethics as well, not only in the research area. But uh, if we assume the global perspective and explore further. Uh, what, in your mind, are the most urgent moral issues that we should talk about? Uh, yeah, I, I think a number of things, uh, uh, you know, um, a couple of things. So first, I think we need to recognize that uh, efforts need to happen uh, in different spaces and multidimensionally, you know, so and, and we need to connect different kinds of conversations uh, and different kinds of uh, efforts uh, to bring about, uh, to, to address the change uh, challenges we have. So one, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's very important to realize that uh, this cannot happen. The challenges we have cannot be addressed in one domain, whether that domain is religious domain, or secular domain or other domains. So we need to make connections. I would say first and foremost is dogma. Dogma is something we really need to address. And dogma comes, and perhaps that reminded me of what Ivan was saying about fanaticism. Maybe that's the other side of it. And you have, you can have different kinds of dogma. Dogma as not religious dogma, but very much also secular dogma. And I understand dogma as a way of when we stop really trying to converse and 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 uh, and seeking, because key to any the different spiritual paths and different ethical paths which are common between between all religions and different value systems, human value systems, whether they're religious or not, is to try to seek uh, and go out, uh, seek a meaningful life. But once you start, when we, once you have this position of self-righteousness, that I've got the truth and other people don't have the truth, 
that is dogma and dogma can come in different forms uh, religious and non-religious you know so i think that is our major 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 obstacle i see the one we have several obstacles but that is how can we tackle that how can we and for me it takes me back to this idea that the archbishop was saying rationality rationality is very very important in different religions in, in the quran it's mentioned a lot and it's not in the sense of oh, i am autonomous uh, um, you know, there's an emphasis on human beings, all human beings being the moral agent and having this moral responsibility called the khilafa. Uh, but in the sense of like, uh, you need to uh, reflect and reason and, and to think as, as moral agents, all of us, what is my role and how is my role to do this, to be better, to make this universe better for all of us? How does it relate to others? So combating dogma also means thinking about rationality but not rationality in the sense of human being or the man being the god of the universe and we don't need each other in, not in that sense but a different kind of rationality uh, that recognizes there's always moral work that we need to be engaged in all of us and to get to a place where we feel like my well-being is very much connected to other people's uh, well-being so that's one thing the other thing is uh, my co-panelists mentioned the commonalities between different religions and different paths i think commonality is very important i agree with them about harmony with the divine with the universe with one another um, uh, and but also i think we should not shy away from our differences and we need to understand our differences and uh, and uh, also uh, the implications of that whether they are theological differences cultural differences um, because also one danger of focusing on the commonalities which is very important is are we giving enough attention to the differences and how can we create spaces where we can think of difference not as a basis for hierarchy not as a basis for some being uh, you know better than others but difference uh, that makes us understand one another better one scholar and i'm sorry i keep going back to the scholar since i teach and study but i think it's relevant because is uh, jerusha uh, um, Tanner Lampety, her, she goes by the last name now as Jerusha uh, uh, Rhodes, and she's based, uh, she's teaching in a seminary in New York, and she has this very book, important book called um, Never Holy Other, and she looks at the religious pluralism in the Quran, and she has these two concepts in, from the Quran that there is a lateral difference, uh, and there is this um, uh, hierarchical or vertical difference, and according to the Quranic worldview, the lateral difference is that there can be different paths to God, there can be different religious communities, and none of them are in a, have a you know, claim to the truth. None of them are better than the others, and she makes an argument for that based on the Quran. The, but the other difference that is the basis of merit is perhaps a difference in which uh, people on an individual level, how you can strive to live a life of remembrance of God, life, a life of uh, taqwa, you know, like you are in the presence of God. And that you can seek it through different paths, whether it's Islam, whether it's Christianity, whether it's uh, other paths as well. Uh, so I think difference is also important. You know, and what can we do with difference and how can we understand difference better? I would say these two, dogma, how do we tackle that and how do we understand it, uh, rationality and then the difference. And then I want to leave some time for us to discuss things. Uh, and maybe you had another question for me. I, yeah. Well, you dealt with the critical preconditions of a successful uh, dialogue in, in many ways. So far, we have realized that we want to discard fanaticism. Uh, the wrong time of type of dogmatism. We need rationality, correctly understood, and and many other points of view. Uh, we'll talk about it uh, in a minute. But uh, uh, now I would call the audience to send some questions via chat uh, because this is a one-time opportunity. I can't promise you that I will very soon get this kind of expertise on hand. But in the meantime, while waiting for the questions, uh, one thing I would like to ask all of you, 
Uh, what is your vision of the future? Uh, in the face of enormous challenges, it seems to me that many people are about to lose their hope. Do we still have hope in solving our problems? Who wants to take a stand on this? <coughs> I think we can never live without hope. Uh, you know, um, it's it's part of our DNA as human being. And um, in terms of um, if we strive to be an ethical human being, and you know, and um, for me, I think spirituality is very important, uh, which has to do also with uh, seeking a relationship with the divine, understood in various ways. But and the other side of that coin is understanding ourselves better. Because I think the two are interconnected. Um, it's all. Uh, it's we. There's no quick solutions, but I think we also need to focus on what's going well. You know what? And there are so many things going well uh, on on the micro context. Whether we uh, take a particular context, uh, you know, I can think of uh, in, in different uh, you know national context or regional context efforts at the micro level that show that humanity, human beings are okay, people understand that we are, uh, our well-being depends on t caring for one another, you know, not in a sort of a uh, kind of like a feel-good way, but like really we understand that part of my well-being is in organically, intricately connected to the other human beings. So one thing is to shed light on what's going well, and I think there are, there are things going well, right? We are so busily improving ourselves and the world that we sometimes forget what has already been done. Maybe it's time to celebrate some successes once in a while. What about Tapio Loam? Well, I think that uh, there is always hope, uh, just like uh, uh, Mulker Sharmani just said. And I think that this is one of the most important roles of world religions, to keep up hope. I mean, whenever there is, there is a stressful situation, there are catastrophes uh, in people's lives. Uh, it is quite common that uh, people uh, seek help from each other, but also from religious uh, dimensions in their lives. And I think that this is one of the most important uh, uh, features of hope. And I think that the religions will have a great role also in the future in this respect. Uh, of course, uh, when we discuss uh, in, in Western countries, when we discuss about hope, for example, in the connection of this climate change uh, problematics, um, then there is uh, uh, usually made a distinction between the que uh, in, in the question, is our hope something that we are just dreaming? Is it well-based? Is it, is it a recent hope? And I just, uh, Professor Risto Sarin from the University of Helsinki uh, has uh, defined, in my opinion, quite well what is a well-reasoned and well-based hope like. And he says that uh, a well-reasoned and well-based hope is something that uh, uh, so, so is something in which, in which um, uh, ex um, um, uh, ex execution, uh, I am able to commit myself so that I am able to do something in order to get that hope to realize itself. So that uh, it, it means my personal involvement. And when we see this um, uh, uh, citizen movement uh, uh, in order to, to, to prevent the climate change, so I think that this is something that is, uh, we are seeing there. So that people are acting in order to, to fulfill their own hope. Yes, very inspiring. Ivan uh, Mokta, is there a beacon of hope? Yes, hope, I think, is, is, is just part of the human heart. We, we cannot let go of hope, uh, especially in critical times. Um, humanity has gone through many transformations because of climate, because of wars, because of epidemics uh, or pandemics. And throughout history, we, there have had, we have seen many points of resolution where humanity has had to put itself together and begin to cooperate. And I, I think we are seeing that already happening. We, we see that there's more um, consciousness about the importance of coming together and cooperate. I, I think that 
perhaps what religions and certain kind of practices and ways to experience the uh, could could help us to understand that we are one. I think uh, uh, Mulki Al Sharmani was saying, well, we are we are part of each other, and whatever happens to me will have an impact in the person next to me and whatever person next to me goes through will have an impact in my life and this in a smaller scale and a bigger scale so there is a there is a, a ground of oneness we can say it's perhaps a mystical ground for for the majority of people however it might be that as i was saying before as we have a, a spiritual seed or a religious seed in all of us by really dedicating and, and taking responsibility to, to go into that level where we are actually experiencing some kind of oneness in our heart and mind allows us to actually come from the place where we truly and deeply believe that we are one humanity together in this. There is a need, of course, to overcome selfishness. I think that is it's an aspect that um, religions have to also address. And be generous. How can we be generous with each other? How can we gen be generous with what we have arrived to as understanding or, or even pieces of the truth that we, can, that we can share with each other? How can we create that space? I think there is hope in that process. I see more and more people, especially young ones, that are searching for sources of evidence in their lives that are tending them towards the inner life. And I think this is helpful. Thank you. We'll have a great opportunity to share pieces of truth because we have a question on the chat. Thank you for an insightful panel. My question is, how can we encourage recognizing and appreciating differences on an everyday level? Any suggestions for practical ways to enable dialogue within diverse value systems? A tough one. Um, Ivan Mukta has raised a hand. Is that intentional or yes. purely accidental? Oh, well, I'm gonna use technology. Anyway, um, if I can say just a few words, I remember a very strong idea of uh, Jacques Maritain, that is a philosopher um, that is uh, originally aligned with the Catholic Church, but he spoke about a very important principle. He said, we have to understand the, um, that the diversity in the unity, that there is a diversity which exists in, within a unity. So even though we are different and we are somewhat sometimes even opposed, there is a, there is a unity that is part of the fact that we live in the same planet just to mention something very concrete and very down to earth. So that understanding as we unpack it and we explain it and we share the importance of that principle of unity should at some point create awareness or spread awareness to take care of each other, to take care of our planet, to take care of ordinary things that happen in life to all of us. I think this, Diversity in the unity is something to explore further. Mulki al Yeah, I would say, um, so let's say if it's religious difference, for example, that we're talking about, and to be much more concrete and focused, let's say now we're in the Finnish context, we know Finland now is becoming, you know, uh, diverse, uh, ethnically, religiously, uh, uh, much more, and uh, uh, going more and more in that direction. I think on a, on a daily on a daily level, as, as an individual, one way of getting uh, to know other, different people and um, uh, um, whether it's our neighborhood or in our schools from religious backgrounds, that, that's a the very simple one. Uh, it's, it's a good idea to get to know different kinds of people in your neighborhood, different people from your religious backgrounds. But I think the other more important one where we can really recognize difference is not only to have these conversations between different religious communities, inter-religious dialogue, which is important, but I think another one that we need is within the same religious communities. You know, whether you are within the Lutheran church or within a particular Muslim community, I think among us, we need to have uh, 
conversations about difference and why difference is important to recognize within the same faith as well as between other faiths, you know, because I'm not so sure within the same faith also how much, how systematic and how much focus are we on really learning and appreciating difference. Uh, so I think that that conversation needs to happen within the same faith based community as well. So these are just my two quick cents that I'd like to share. It seems to me that it takes a lot of courage to talk about differences, because uh, nowadays we are very uh, much afraid of hurting one another's feelings and, and in the fear of being insensitive, we simply stop talking about things that are, are uh, differences. That's a great contribution. What about Tapio Law? I think that uh, we, uh, uh, we, we tend to underestimate the role of differences. We all people, all, all human beings, we are different from each other. And I think even uh, very usual meetings, we, we come together with our colleagues and, and other people. Uh, I think that there would be no point of coming together or meeting or discussing if we all uh, always agreed with each other. There would be no point to come together. So that the, the, the uh, root um, initiative or, or the uh, impetus for, for, for coming together is always that we think differently we would like to uh, shape the future and shape the reality so that the different opinions and the different viewpoints, different religions uh, could contribute uh, to the, uh, our common understanding. So that uh, I think that we should also value the differences between us. And uh, what comes now to the, to the idea of how we can cope with differences, I think that the problem is not the differences, but the problem is how we can come uh, how, how we cope with them, uh, differences between each other. And I think that one of the solutions is, is uh, very deeply rooted in, in the view how we generally view uh, human beings. What is a human being? And uh, 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 Yvonne, you, you in your speech, you referred to individualism. And, and I think that um, uh, perhaps uh, quite often we think of, of uh, different uh, people or different human beings as individuals. But I think that um, I would rather use the words uh, or, or, the, or the concept of person. I mean, indivi in, an, an individual uh, human being is always defined by his or her individual characteristics. And, uh, and he or she is always defined uh, alone. But when we talk about a person, then we always define a person in, in the uh, very large context of his uh, relations to other persons, so that there is a web of relations uh, in a person's life. And I think that we need to restore the, the significance of, of what it means to be a living person. Uh, so the person that is uh, the result of be, being in contact with numerous other persons uh, in the face of his life. So that, um, yes, person preferred, uh, I, I prefer person uh, to, to individual. And um, one more thing now when, when I remember, uh, it is so interesting that we are discussing these kind, kinds of issues in connection with uh, other issues of global ethics in connection of uh, business ethics. And I think that this is a most important and, and uh, uh, what a wonderful uh, mixture of, of viewpoints where a, a humanistic uh, standpoint comes together with a, with, with a very economic uh, way of thinking. And I guess this is something uh, that we really desperately need in today's world. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. And, and also the discussion on differences and diversity is very relevant from the point of view of business life. We go, because we talk about diversity all the time. We want to add diversity in all imaginable contexts. But sometimes that's a little bit hypocritical. <laughs> it's, we sort of tolerate diversity, but we do not benefit from it. If only all people were like me, then life would be much easier. Why do they have to be so very different? And, and the distinction between individual and person is a great contribution to that 
discussion because it helps us contextualize ourselves. How did I become uh, like me? Because of my history, because of the connections I have, because of all those things that I have fed into my brain. And so it's easy to understand that other people may have different parts in their lives. They developed in a different way. But uh, Yvan Mukta, I would still like to see how you connect uh, this uh, difference and diversity to the basic humanity that you often talk about. Well, my idea when I spoke about individualism or the individuality, I rather spoke more as a category that is being somehow limiting ourselves. And there is a strong tendency in capitalist society to, to actually revolve around the individual gain. So that was more where I was coming from. Um, I, I think the understanding of human beings is, is so important. I think part of the discussion needs to consider that we are human animals as well. There's a part of us that is has also a, a dark side, we can even say, and is also having a predatory side. And that is perhaps the most critical aspect of ethics, how to put some restraint to that or how to heal that or how to integrate that aspect. So human beings, all of us have that tendency to, to feed from other humans somehow, like a predator, like an animal does. Now, human beings also have the capacity to cooperate, to be with each other. And that is most likely what we are now engaging. How can we be with each other? But then human beings, as we start speaking about how they are somehow built up, how we are built up, have a third aspect that I consider we can call the angelic aspect or spiritual aspect. That is the one that makes us live for another human being. So it's not the animal that lives from one another animal. It's a predatory tendency. It's not just a human being that is able to have dialogues and cooperate, but it's also sometimes having this angelical seed or, or a spiritual tendency, which allows us to think and really care for the life of someone else and eventually sacrificing our own benefit or our own lives in, even to some extent for the, for the sake of someone else's integrity or life. So understanding the, this, this components of each of us as, per, as people, as persons, and, and then addressing all these levels should be, I guess, one base for developing a ethics that serves our humanity. If we think only that we're humans and there's no actual predatory tendency, that predatory tendency will come up through economy, through business, through even religion through any environment where that predatory tendency has the chance to go and bite someone else. So that needs to be addressed, needs to be addressed and empower also the ability to have dialogues and be with each other. But also why not? To also inspire that other tendency to live for another human that is like more like an angel sort of. I'm not saying this is easy, but I think that this base is quite fundamental for thinking about ethics in the future. Sometimes when we talk about the animal side of human beings, we refer to it in somewhat pejorative ways. But recently, Rodger Bregman has written a book about the other interpretation. He calls us homo puppy and says that puppies are altruistic, enthusiastic, playful, and all those qualities may be part of the human psyche as well. So we can interpret the animal part in different ways. But now I suggest that we apply the... I think this is an overlapping between the yes. animal realm and characteristics and the human realm. But well, maybe another discussion for that. <laughs> yes. Now um, I, I su suggest that we apply the mnemonic device uh, developed by the author Tolstoy. He said that what is said first and what is said last is remembered the best. So <laughs> now, now it's your choice to your, your opportunity to create a lasting impression on each other's and our audience's minds. What is it uh, that you want to say to finalize this discussion? Would the Archbishop want to start? 
Um, well, first, first of all, I would like to thank you so much for this opportunity of being part of this panel. And, uh, and I think that this issue, uh, global ethics, is of utmost importance, especially today. And uh, as I said, I'm very pleased to also see that uh, uh, it is now here connected with the issue of, of business ethics, so that um, it is something that we really need. Actually, I think that to all uh, uh, so religions should have conversation also with sciences, all kinds of sciences. And uh, we should have conversation with each other. And all this needs uh, two things. So first of all, humility and also respect for each other. You are a great example of the dialogue with science. Your doctoral dissertation dealt with uh, science too. Thank you. Multial uh, Sharmani. Your microphone is yes. off. Sorry. So I just wanted to add a, just very quickly to what my co-panelists were saying, the part about the animal self. And so I just want to share also this, uh, the same concepts from, from a Quranic uh, worldview, you know, so there are these, uh, the, the notion of the the uh, the self that incites evil uh you know uh, uh, and that's a potential we all have there's the self that is reflective or, or blaming not in the sense like you're hard on yourself but you are reflecting on what you do there are different spiritual stations and then the ultimate is the self that is satisfied spiritually and has gained proximity uh, with the divine. I, when uh, these are concepts from the Quran, and these are different potentials within each human being, and the idea is to strive. When I was uh, hearing Yvonne talking, I, I thought about that, and, and I think what's important is the spiritual striving. The idea is to work on yourself, and you know, ethically to work on yourself. Uh, just my last words would be uh, is. Um, um, also to uh, create space for multiple voices within religious domain. Uh, you know, because there are new voices, uh, there are uh, also new discourses, there are new bodies of religious knowledge, and so there's a need also to study again each what one's own tradition and to have a sense of these new voices. That's very important. Uh, your, uh, the business ethics and the global ethics is very important because for me it highlights we need to adopt a holistic approach. If, you know, if we want to think about a better world and uh, work towards that, we can't think of business here and climate there and religious there. We have to very much be aware and adopt an approach that is holistic and interconnects these different uh, domains. These are the two things that I would want to highlight. Thank you. And Yvonne Mukta. Thank you. Um, I remember when I was a student at university, I read the book, is, uh, the book of Max Weber, Spirit of Capitalism. The ethic, the, no, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism that actually make a very clear, clear connection between how religious ethics, Protestant ethics, thinking basically of the new movements of the 16th century of Calvin, Jean Calvin, Calvinism, and then Lutheranism, develop our society into embrace actually what nowadays we know as capitalism. And well, that is actually developing ourselves even further into making things more sophisticated and automatized. So one of the things I would like to finish with is how actually intelligent, artificial intelligence is having more and more um, influence in our lives. And as human beings, I think we need to remain as human as possible. We cannot automatize all the processes. We cannot let the, the algorithms think for ourselves, for the future and for life, because that's a complicated issue that we don't wanna go into there. Let's say we have a car that is intelligent and can drive itself. And then for some reason we are to crash and the car starts to analyzing the possible scenarios. And then there's a baby there with a grandmother on the pram and then the other side there are two teenagers. Then the intelligence, the artificial intelligence have to decide whether it protects the baby, protects the teenagers, or protects the, 
the, the one that is driving the car. Let's say some things like that need to be discussed in the future. How we can become more human ourselves and not just let all that type of resolution uh, sooner or later will become automatized. And I think the bottom line here is to know oneself, to know who we are, to embrace our sensitivity, to be able to connect to our true feelings and to be able to evolve our feelings and our thoughts into more harmony, because that is the key for social harmony. If individuals or people, personas, are not in harmony, the interactions between them are not going to be harmonious by defect. So I hope that we can move into understanding our responsibility, each one of us, to create that new world if we can talk about a new world. Let's see. Thank you. Uh, great ideas and a great conversation. I'm so pleased that you took time from your busy lives to attend our discussion. So thank you, dear panelists, for this thought feeding and heartwarming discussion. And thank you for the hopeful visions for the future. Thank you all participants for being with us today. And thank you our technical team, Jolita and Nina. This was the last Global Goodness webinar this year. We'll come back on the 25th of January with a half day online seminar called Sustainable Futures. Today's discussion reminded me of an old, long forgotten tune. Through all kinds of weather, what if the sky should fall? Just as long as we are together, it doesn't matter at all. So have a great holiday season and keep the faith. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.